Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cornerstone's inaugural uh, webinar on its Public Law Week. Uh, we have uh, four uh, webinars this week and one in-person event. Um, the, <coughs> this morning, we're going to deal with challenging policies in the courts um, with myself, James Finley, Lindsay Johnson, and Sarah Salmon. Um, just uh, a few bits of housekeeping whilst people are still joining. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on our website um, shortly after it has um, finished. Uh, if you have questions um, and answers, please use the question and answer function um, on the um, box at the bottom of your screen, and we will attempt to get to them uh, before the end of the um, hour. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Public Law Week um, has an in-person session on Thursday. That is sold out, but all the other sessions, uh, there are still spaces available, and there will be a slide at the end of uh, the uh, session this morning uh, reminding you what they are. So, um, reverting to this morning, uh, our order of play, if we could... Have the next slide, Lindsay, please, is um, Sarah Salmon is going to deal with an overview of the key principles. Um, Lindsay is then going to deal with challenges to policies in the High Court um, as a mechanism to enforce specific rights. I'm then going to say something about direct challenges to policies, including where a policy is not adopted. And then Sarah is going to grapple the thorny topic of dealing with challenges in county court proceedings. Uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Um, you should have had biographies of all of us, um, but let me just introduce um, the other two um, speakers this morning. Uh, Lindsay specializes in public law, uh, particularly in terms of adult social care and health care corporate government and policy. And just to pick up one of the many quotes from the uh, directories, Chambers 2023 calls them an absolute powerhouse. Sarah, who's going to be speaking next, specializes in local government, housing and property law. She's the chair of the Social Housing Law Association, Housing Law Association and Legal 500 2023 describe her as simply exceptional. So over to the simply exceptional Sarah um, to deal with an um, overview of key principles. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure I can live up to that this morning, James, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the key principles in challenging policies in the county courts. And as you'll all be aware, um, public bodies are accountable for their decision making uh, and decisions they take and such decisions are often based or or at least guided by a policy that that public body has in place. In the summer of last year the Guardian reported that um, in terms of successful High Court challenges to government policy and decisions of public bodies, the success rate had fallen. It was said to have been 26% in terms of success rate in the courts, if it was measured in terms of matters that come to a final hearing. It is still important, though, ever, um, however, that the courts are uh, able to look and scrutinise decisions of public bodies. And as Lord Newberger said in, in a lecture in 2013, it is one of the most important functions the courts have. So just turning to the role of policy, um, we've been spoiled relatively recently in that the Supreme Court has, has looked at these issues in two linked cases. We have the uh, A, which you can see the full, uh, full citation on the slide, and we also have BF Eritrea, and you'll see that full citation on the, the next slide uh, for your records. In A, as you'll see from the slide I've set out, the court set painted the picture in, in terms of what policies sort of meant and were in, in relation to public law challenges, and it's important to consider this um, principle before moving on to the underlying legal principles of how courts can be challenged. 
you'll all be aware that sometimes you have to have policies that are dictated by statute uh, and others uh, you just have that are not statutory policies. You often have a wide discretion, but importantly, what A was saying is they are not the law. They are not law. And they are simply statements about how to apply the law or how best to administer the law when you are taking decisions as a public authority. So in A and uh, BF Eritrea, uh, next slide please, Lindsay, the Supreme Court clarified um, the court's role in terms of intervention and it started with the case of Gillick. Now most of you will be aware of Gillick, it's a relatively old case now, but the Supreme Court confirmed that it's Gillick is the starting point, and that is the principle upon which provides a basis for the courts to intervene when it comes to challenging policies. Now, in Gillick, the question was um, whether or not in any circumstances a, a doctor can lawfully uh, prescribe contraception for a 16 year old without the consent or knowledge of the parent. And what Lord Scarman said, um, and you'll find this at page 181, uh, letter F, is that it is only if the guidance permits or encourages unlawful conduct in the provision of, in that case, contraceptive services, that it can be set aside as being the exercise of the statutory discretionary power in an unreasonable way. So as set out in the slide, what you're primarily considering is whether or not a policy has positively authorised or approved unlawful conduct. Next slide, please. The court in A and uh, BF um, went on to look at the Gillick test and both Lord Sales and Lord Burnett described the test as straightforward. And it said it simply is looking for a comparison of what the relevant law requires and what a policy statement says regarding what a person should do. The court then went on broadly to identify three types of cases where applying Gillick, a policy may be found to be unlawful. And I've set out on the next slide the three types of cases in full and this is taken from paragraph 46 of a as set out on the slide now the first one is if you like straightforward gillick so that is where a policy includes a positive statement of law which is wrong and that is likely to then induce a person to act in in an unlawful way the second type is where there is a duty to have a policy that contains accurate information, advice about the law and so on and so forth. But within that policy, there's a misstatement of law or there's been an omission, which means that um, it doesn't do what it should uh, under the duty to have that policy. And the third type of case is very similar to the second. That's where there isn't a duty to have a policy, but there is a policy in place and there's either a misstatement of the law in that policy, there's an omission which, is, uh, which has the effect of misleading um, in terms of the legal position within that policy. And it's important you'll note there on the third one is that when you're looking at it, you read it as a whole. And this is important because the court went on in A and BF to talk about treating policies pragmatically. For example, if you have a discretion within a policy, the court said it would be unrealistic to expect the full detail within that policy of how someone would go about exercising that discretion in every single circumstance. So what the court shouldn't do, and this again was made clear by the Supreme Court, is it shouldn't place too onerous an obligation on those issuing policies. And what Lord Sales and Lord Burnett said was, whenever a legal duty is imposed, there is always the possibility that it might be misunderstood or breached by the person subject to it. That 
is inherent in the nature of the law. And the remedy is to have access to the courts to compel that person to act in accordance with their duty. So yes, you have a policy, your policy may may set up everything as it should in terms of legal obligations, but there's always going to be the risk that it's implied incorrectly or it's misunderstood. So that was made clear by the Supreme Court that we have to be a bit pragmatic. We can't look at it in minute detail. It has to be read as a whole, and there has to be a certain amount of leeway given to public authorities, especially where there's an element of discretion. The court went on in A and BF to look at other legal challenges and legal principles that may apply when you're challenging a policy. And in relation to unfairness, which is a challenge I think we often see, whether it be in the high court or, or in the county courts, it said that, of course, a claimant is entitled to redress when it comes to unfairness, that might be procedural unfairness, but there was no sound basis for conceptual basis for separating out unlawfulness due to unfairness from unlawfulness for any other reason, uh, and that was A, applying the detention action case that I've set out on the slides there. So you can still challenge in terms of unfairness, but um, unfairness due to unlawfulness is still unlawful as it would be for any other reason in terms of the legal principles. In addition, you may, and this is the final uh, slide before I hand over to Lindsay to look at more specific challenges on the principles, there are other avenues upon which a claimant can challenge policies. You could test it against legislation or against convention rights. There must also be, uh, there, there must always be access to justice uh, for people. E your policy must also not limit or fetter discretion. So you shouldn't have an overly rigid policy, which means that somebody applying that policy is prevented from a true and proper exercise of, of discretion when looking at that policy. And the other important challenge when it comes to policy, in my view, and it's, it's not really a legal principle, it's more the type of policies that can be challenged, is this idea of secret policies. And of course, we saw that relatively recently in the case of HM against the Secretary of State for the Home Department. The citation for that is 2022 EWHC 695 in the admin court. And in that case, the Home Office actually conceded that it had a secret and a blanket policy of seizing and downloading data from mobile phones of all those arising in small boats. And that sort of secret and blanket policy was unlawful. So those are the basic legal principles and the types of policies and types of things that can be challenged. So I'm going to hand over to Lindsay now, who's going to look at... Um, how you can obtain a substantive benefit by challenging policies in the court. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Um, what this, the rest of today does is look at the ways in which those different general principles that Sarah's just outlined are used and applied by the courts. And so I, I start that by looking at the use of challenges to policies to obtain substantial benefits. So I'm not concerned with overturning policies, or at least not the whole policy. Um, and I'm not concerned with using policies as a defence to public law proceedings, but rather the use of public challenges to elicit a substantive benefit or enforce the performance of a function. It's quite an important caveat to that, um, which comes from the All the Citizens and Secretary of State case. This is one of the good law project cases and anybody who um, has ever picked up a paper or looked on their Twitter feed in the last couple of years will know of the good law project and the challenges they've brought to various um, government um, approaches. This one was the one that you may recall, which was to the use of WhatsApp and other private forms of communication by central government ministers. And the essential challenge was this was a that the policy of using it was wrong because there is a, 
a legal requirement for all communications within government to be recorded for prosperity for the benefit of the, the common good in the future so you can see how decision making was followed. Now, the High Court dismissed the substance of the challenge, but in doing so, they made a number of important observations about the use of policies and drew distinctions between policies and law. And these build on some of the general principles that Sarah's just been talking to you about. So I've set out the, the five key principles in this slide. Policies are different from law, and they don't create legal rights as such. So that, that might seem like an obvious point. If you have a statutory right to do something, it's enforceable. If there's a policy that creates that right, it's more going to be in the nature of guidance. And you go back to the A case that Sarah was talking about as an example of that. Then, of course, that they serve a useful function to promote good administration. And this is the, the general principle that like cases should be treated alike and unlike cases should be treated differently. Um, that a failure to comply with a policy will constitute a breach of public law. But, and this is where we get to the piece I'm talking about, those cases that have been successful are concerned with interferences with individual rights. So what you're talking about is not using the policy to challenge the policy per se, but using the policy to assert your own individual right. The other two points made there are to emphasize that public law has not yet reached the stage where administrative policies will always and without question become enforceable as a matter of law. But the court gave a, a, a bit of a of a steer that that is the way it sees the law in de as developing and of course the law develops over time and the rights that we all take for granted and have to secure now are very different to those which you'd have had to have done 50 or 100 years ago. So what we're talking about here then is the use of a policy to undermine a decision determining an existing right. So I'll take a simple if fairly stupid example. A local authority has a contractual duty to allow parking to every household on an estate. And they adopt a policy for that, which says we'll only grant permits to people with red cars. Now, if you have a, a blue car, how do you enforce your contractual rights to park your car or to have a permit? Well, you can sue on the contract, but that challenge is going to be long, drawn out in the county court, and it's going to come up against the buffer of a local authority saying, well, we're the decision maker, and that you as the county court can't interfere with that because you don't have the necessary powers. You could, and this is pointing at what Sarah is going to talk about later, you could wait to be sued for the money, for any fine that was incurred, and then defend that on public law principles. But that always has a risk to it. And there's always the concern of no smoke without fire. Or you could challenge the policy itself by way of judicial review. But that's only going to obtain a reconsideration of the policy itself. And the policy being quashed and remitted back. And that, of course, has carries with it the possibility that the future policy may be even less advantageous to you. It may say, we won't grant parking permits at all. It'll just be a free-for-all. And that would not achieve your aim. What's better from the applicant's perspective is to seek to rely on your right to a permit and suggest that the policy itself is being applied in a way as to frustrate that right. Now that ensures, if your claim is successful, and on my absurd facts it almost certainly would be, that an applicant obtains the right to park his or her blue car. Now from the local authority's perspective, there's likewise benefits to not having the entire policy declared unlawful and not having light shone on the consultation process. And some of the things that, some of the darker corners of that, are the things that James is gonna talk about later on equality impact assessments, the darker edges of decision making, who said what when, and so on and so forth. And they very rarely withstand that degree of scrutiny. Now, I said that was a, a stupid example, but it's not that stupid. 
There's a case called R.S. and Brent um, from 2020 in the Court of Appeal. In that case, R.S. was it concerned the award of blue disabled parking badges. R.S. was somebody with a non-mobility related disability. So on the facts, he had autism, very, very severe autism, which prevented him being in crowds and therefore entitled him on the medical evidence to a blue parking permit. Brent's interpretation of the regulations governing blue parking badges caused them to adopt a policy whereby any person applying for a badge who had a non-mobility need had to undertake a mobility assessment. So you had to turn up and somebody would watch you walk and determine whether or not you were sufficiently mobility impaired to be entitled to a blue badge. Now, RS challenged that approach on the basis that he had an entitlement to a blue badge under the regulations. He met the qualifying requirements and that any policy requiring him to have a mobility assessment was frustrating that right. So very similar to the way in which we just put the previous one. In the event, the law or the government clarified the law prior to the substantive hearing and the case turned essentially on a question of costs. But the essence of the role of the challenge is there. What RS was trying to do was not to overturn the whole policy itself, but to say that that policy in its application frustrated a legal right to which he was entitled. If we look at some other examples, and one of the most common is in policies for the allocation of accommodation by local authorities under part six of the Housing Act 1996. I want to take two or three examples of this to sort of give an idea of how these sorts of challenges frequently work. So one would have thought that the law was settled in 2009 with the House of Lords decision in Ahmad and Newham, whereby what the House of Lords say in relation to a challenge to Newham's allocation scheme was, yes, you have a right to have your application for a house properly considered in accordance with the lawful allocation policy, but how that allocation policy is pulled together and what priority it affords to people and what preference it gives to people is a matter for the local authority in their discretion. So you would have thought that that was an end to it in large Part because it's the court saying, yes, you have to have a policy. Yes, statute requires you to have a policy, but how you do it is up to you and you can only challenge it on conventional public law grounds of reasonableness. But that's not stopped a vast number of challenges to the application of um, allocation policies. If I take Gulu, the second um, bullet point on your slide, as an example, that concerned an allocation policy that sought to implement the principle of localism within local authority governance. And so it said that, that, alloc that their allocation policy would only allow onto the scheme those who had a local connection with the area, who'd lived in the area, who could establish a long connection with the area. Now on its face, that is a completely unobjectionable policy. It follows from government approach to localism, from various elements of legislation, such as the Localism Act, which seek to enforce that, various changes to the um, to part six of the Housing Act 1996 that allowed you to, to sort of be a bit more discriminatory in that way. But what happens with people who can't establish a local connection for some reason? And in Gulu, you had two groups of people. One were Irish travellers, the other were asylum seekers, all of whom said, because of our transient nature of the way in which we live, we cannot establish 10 years residence in your area or five years residence in your area. Therefore, this policy is discriminating against us because we're less likely to be able to establish a local connection. So there you have a challenge, not to the whole policy, but to the application of that policy to the individual circumstances of a group of individuals. And those individuals are saying, we have a right in statute to be on your housing register, and you are frustrating that right by the policy you have adopted. What the court found was that there was discrimination and that the 
efforts of the local authority were not sufficient to alleviate that discrimination, but that Hillingdon um, should be afforded an opportunity to justify the discrimination in the policy. The other two examples there, Exe and Southwark and Jaberry versus Westminster, are both very similar. If I take Jaberry and Westminster, which is quite a recent decision as an example, um, Mr. Jaberry again applies for housing. He has um, quite complex medical needs and he challenged, but he was also homeless. Uh, what Westminster's policy does is it either categorizes you as homeless or as somebody who has a medical need. You can't be both. And so he challenged it saying, well, I want to be able to choose. I want to be able to have the right to say, I want my application decided on the basis of my medical need, because that's going to give me a greater chance of obtaining accommodation than if I just go down the homelessness route. The court applied the ARMAD principle, which we looked at right at the beginning, and said, well, this policy is within the permissible boundaries of a local authority's discretion and therefore lawful. And so that and Gulu provide two examples of where the policy is, is being challenged in the way in which it's applied, not for the policy so much itself, but for the way in which that policy doesn't make provision for certain groups of people. We take another slightly more complicated example. This is in Holberg and Hinckley and Bosworth Borough Council. Now, this is quite a difficult case. It relates to an application or relates to a community protection warning notice under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. And Mr. Holberg was a, a local landlord and he was served with a community protection warning um, under the Act and sought to challenge the decision to issue that. And amongst the many, many challenges he brought to that decision was that it was contrary to the local authority's own antisocial behaviour policy. He said that that policy applied what was termed an incremental approach to enforcement of rights. So you shouldn't start with a community protection warning notice, you should start with a form of discussion. And he said, well, there was no discussion. You went straight to the, no you went straight to the warning notice. And therefore, your pol you haven't followed your own policy. What the court did as a way around that, because Mr. Holbert's case was on its facts, not particularly meritorious, was to rely on the well-established principle in the Raja and Secretary of State that where a public authority is issued or adopted a practice which proposed, represents how it proposes to act in a given area, the law will require that to be honoured unless there's a reason not to. This is the idea of like cases are treated alike and unlike cases are treated differently. So on its face then, that, that was a, a, a knockout point for Mr Holberg. But what you also have to overlay with that is the fact, and this is what leads to the decision in all the citizens and some of the, the, the ANS and SS and Secretary of State case that Sarah referred to, is that where there's a, any ambiguity in a policy, it's for the local, it's, sorry, it's for the court to interpret that policy and determine what it says and how it's applied. And that's the proposition you get from Mandala versus Secretary of State for the Home Department. And so what the court does in Mr Holberg's case is say, well, not entirely sure that the policy is clear. So therefore, I, as the judge, have to interpret that policy. And I find that it was open to them to not follow the step by step approach, but to miss out a step if they thought the circumstances so justified. And if you apply that approach, then the court determines that the policy itself permitted Hinckley and Bosworth to act as they did. So what those cases demonstrate, whether in the context of high-end local government, sorry, central government decision-making in terms of a 
retention of um, data or local authority decision making in terms of parking or in terms of housing or in terms of antisocial behaviour is that challenges that are brought in the high courts, the, the initial challenge, are very rarely directly to the whole of the policy. What they're there for is to assert an individual right and to claim that the policy in some way frustrates that right. The more substantive, the more complicated challenges that seek to undermine the whole policy are what James is now going to take you through. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, so Lindsay's dealt with uh, obtaining a, a, a benefit or seek to obtain a benefit by way of the policy. And um, Sarah's going to uh, deal with using policy and private law proceedings. Uh, but I'm going to deal with direct challenges to policies, including where they're not adopted. So that's when um, a, a, a local authority or central government, but I, for my purposes, I'm going to be primarily taking the example of a local authority has adopted or proposing to adopt a policy and it is threatened with and then subject to challenge. Um, that, that there are innumerable cases of, of policies being challenged both centrally and locally and um, it, from, from all sorts of reasons. So it, in the time available, it, it's not possible to to cover all of those. So what I thought I'd do is just take one case, um, which is on the next slide, and um, talk through that um, to give you some uh, idea of the approach, particularly uh, seeking to defend challenges to policies um, that uh, uh, may be of interest. Now, the Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole Council is a recent case involving uh, SEVs. Um, uh, sexual entertainment venues and um, the uh, I've just put on the screen the the opening words of the judge in that case and the challenge was successful um, was a challenge to the decision to adopt a new sexual establishment policy and it was challenged on consultation and public sector equality duty grounds as well as an assertion that the resultant policy fettered discretion uh, and um, spoiler alert in the sense the challenge succeeded as I've indicated on consultation and PSED grounds but not on the resultant policy uh, fettering discretion. Now to, to understand this case a little um, it's necessary to have some regard to the statutory background and most policies are put forward against a statutory background it's set out in the local government miscellaneous provisions act uh, and it Essentially, it provides that um, one, one grant, amongst others, that a local authority can refuse an application for a license is that if there are um, the number of venues, establishments in an area exceeds the number which the authority considers is appropriate for that locality. And what the authority in this case were doing is seeking to set out what they thought was appropriate. Um, so that um, <clears throat> The, it's, it's a difficult area of law um, and the, uh, anyone dealing with it um, has to grapple with the moral issues that um, SEVs give rise to. And um, the judge pointed out the dilemma for the authority and the basis of the in the next slide. And the, the, the authority had to grapple with um, competing issues. Um, so he said, on the one hand, it's not open to a local authority to exclude SEVs from their area on the sole basis that it considers them immoral. So that would suggest perhaps that you can leave uh, moral matters to one side altogether. However, the judge went on to say a local authority is not thereby precluded from taking into account objections from the local community as to whether there should be an SEV. Um, for other reasons, even if such reasons, um, thank you, even if such reasons could be said to derive from or amount to a particular moral stance. And in particular, the authority, the, the particular case which set out the uh, that moral objections weren't relevant, is not authority that 
sexual sex equality based concerns should not be taken into account by a local authority. So it, it, it's a difficult issue there, and it's very difficult for a, an officer writing a report to members to get over on the one hand that they're not entitled to take into account um, simple matters of morality, but that they shouldn't exclude um, sex equality based concerns. Um, uh, so that was the um, what led at the heart of the challenge that what officers had done was to uh, prevent members when they were determining the policy take into account the sex equality based concerns on the basis that uh, morality and moral issues were excluded. So we now look at the, the, the three potential grounds of challenge dealing with the intravirus fashioning of discretion first. And um, when one is considering a policy, um, it's important to have regards to the terms of the statutory framework, which is why I took you to that at the outset in this case. Um, it, these are um, normal, I might say almost bog standard public law grounds, but they need to be considered uh, when a policy is being put into place. So have regard to the terms of the statutory framework, um, have regard to material circumstances, but only material circumstances. Ensure that the policy doesn't fetter discretion, which is a matter Sarah alluded to in her opening remarks. It shouldn't be so strict that um, it doesn't allow for exceptions. Uh, ensure it's not irrational and ensure it doesn't breach a legitimate expectation. Uh, and the latter ground may um, overlap to some extent with what Lindsay was talking about earlier. Legitimate expectations tend to uh, be uh, relevant to individuals or a group of individuals rather than the public as a whole. In this case, the policy, although ostensibly um, strictly drafted, uh, wasn't found to fetter the discretion so that um, the authority could make a decision uh, contrary to its policy um, if it so required. Um, so what uh, to take away from this is, is that um, it is important to have regard to the statutory framework and it is important to have regard to the particular drafting of the policy. Um, the next ground of challenge, or the second ground of challenge, which did succeed, and if we could have the next slide, please, was, was dealing with the um, BSED um, issues. And um, I'm afraid I'd rather uh, filled your paper up with uh, your slide up with, uh, with smallish writing, but the case of Bracking and others provides, which was cited by the judge, uh, provides a very good um, summary of the issues that um, you need to take into account when considering the public sector quality duty. And that duty will apply to any decision from, from planning to social services. But it's a matter that has to be had regard to. Um, it, it's a due regard duty, looking at um, the points in, in bold in the middle of the slide. It's a due regard duty, which means that it's not requiring a, a particular outcome. It's just something that you have to have regard to and you have to, uh, as Sorry, if we can go back one slide. Um, if we uh, look at subparagraph C, um, it has to be exercised in substance with rigor and with an open mind. Um, so, the, and it has to be uh, considered by the decision maker. Um, so, the, the courts have said that there needs to be rigor in both inquiring and reporting uh, by officials to members. So it, it's not a matter when compiling a report in support of introducing a policy um, that can be uh, dealt with, um, or overlooked, dealt with briefly or overlooked, um, and particularly in where you have sex, uh, sexual based concerns, SEVs as they were in this case, um, that uh, should have been ringing warning bells about the um, PSED. Um, it was considered in that case by the council, 
but the judge wasn't convinced that they'd approached it sufficiently rigorously uh, and they, they'd taken uh, all relevant matters into account. So it is a, um, a live issue in any uh, decision by a council to adopt a policy. In some cases, it be more relevant than others, uh, but um, working one's way through the um, various steps required in the POCD as uh, set out in Bracken should um, reduce the risk of challenge. The last um, ground that uh, arose um, was uh, relating to uh, consultation. And uh, there are uh, a large number of um, cases involving a failure to consult properly. The source case is Cochrane um, back in 2001 about the closing, closing of a care home. And the um, criteria um, for uh, proper consultation is that it must be undertaken at a time when proposals are still at a formative stage. It must include sufficient reasons to allow those consulted to give an intelligent consideration. There must be adequate time and the product consultation must be conscientiously taken into account. Now one can fail at any aspect of those stages. Um, uh, the, in, in Bournemouth, it, it was the last bullet point on which the council failed. They hadn't conscientiously taken into account the product of consultation because they um, wrongly, as the judge found, uh, considered that uh, complaints based or, or objections uh, based on concern about the type of venue were simply moral objections, whereas in fact, as the judge found, there were proper issues and material issues that lay behind them that should have been considered. So the, that is a, 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 an overview of the three grounds of challenge that um, were brought in that case, two of which succeeded. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with some tips um, in terms of seeking to uh, prevent or reduce the risk of challenge to um, policies. Firstly, time spent in reconnaissance and seldom wasted. So what I mean by that is that it's important to ensure that you've um, considered the policy in detail and looked at the statutory framework and um, um, thought about it um, adequately in advance doesn't necessarily mean taking advice, but if taking advice is necessary, do that. Um, but uh, reduce the risk in advance rather than try and make up later. Secondly, beware of absolutes or trying to oversimplify for councillors. And that was a ground which Bournemouth fell far low. Um, with difficult concepts, it can be. Um, one can be tempted to try and reduce them to simple sound bites uh, to enable councillors to grasp the concerns. But uh, if they're set out in the report, that will come back to bite. Thirdly, don't let conclusions feed into the handling of prior material. And what I mean by that is that when you're setting out the observations, the consultation responses, the objections and the like, um, don't um, pass judgment on them at that stage. Again, that's what form of Belfalo, they um, suggested such matters were inadmissible um, before coming to a proper discussion. Uh, and finally, defensive report writing can be succinct, so you don't, don't feel the need to cover every point in the report. And to remind you that um, if somebody raises something after the report becomes public, um, it's always worth giving consideration to orally supplementing a report before committee to try and reduce the risks of challenge. So um, that's all I have to say. I'm going to pass over to Sarah now to finish off and deal with the um, use of uh, policy in the county court. Thanks, James. So um, the principles in relation to county court proceedings are the same that both Lindsay and James and myself have taken you through. Um, and on the first slide, you can see there are a couple of cases there in the 1970s, 
But really, um, the raising of public law defences in private law proceedings became common practice after the Wandsworth and Winder decision that's on uh, bullet point three of your slide. Now, after Wandsworth and Winder, there's been uh, more recent, or well, relatively recent cases. And the main second bullet point on your slide highlights that um, in the county court, you're not subject to the same procedural restrictions of the administrative court. And what I mean by that is there was a case in 2009 um, called Doherty and Birmingham City Council. And the House of Lords in that case reaffirmed the winder principles, but acknowledged that in the county court, the traditional approach to judicial review just can't apply, needs to be expanded so that uh, effectively the court can assess, uh, make its own assessment of the relevant facts. So it will be the subject of evidence cross-examination, which is highly unusual when you're talking about judicial reviews. And although the focus of these slides are on some housing cases, because challenging on public law principles seems more prevalent there, it's right to acknowledge that this is not just about housing cases. I've put two examples on the slide. Lindsay, of course, mentioned in his talk that you could wait to be sued and then bring up a public law defence. Um, in the University College London case, that was an application for an injunction. And actually, it was consideration of an injunction at an interim stage. And what the court said is, as well as the balance of convenience and discretion, which all play a factor in whether or not an interim injunction should be made, the court should also be satisfied that there is clearly no public law defence to the claim as part of its assessment as to whether or not an interim injunction should be made. So it's rain, it, it can be raised across a spectrum of um, different types of cases and decisions, uh, as long as, of course, you've got a public body, a public authority making those decisions. So in terms of some examples of challenges, on the next slide, I've, I've given quite a list. And again, I've uh, they are all, all housing cases. Um, I haven't got time to go through them all. I just want to pick out a couple of the, the successful challenges to give you an idea of how um, public law defences work in the county court. Now, the first is the Eastland Homes case there in White. Now, in that case, Mrs White had been granted what's uh, called a starter tenancy, which is effectively an assured shorthold tenancy by um, Eastland Homes. And it, it was for a fixed term of six months, and there was an option uh, after those six months to either extend it or it would become fully assured. Now, in relation to the first starter tenancy, there was actually a possession order made. And so Miss White's first starter tenancy was ended, but she was granted after the possession order, a further starter tenancy by the Housing Association. And this was the tenancy that was the subject of a public law defence in the county court. And what happened when an, she, she fell into arrears and there were some allegations of antisocial behaviour. Now, Eastland Homes decided to serve a notice. And when they served a notice based on rent arrears and antisocial behaviour, they also um, gave Miss White advice as to the appeal process and actually provided a copy of the policy uh, as to how an appeal process would work so she could challenge the service of the notice and say that possession proceedings should not be brought. She went through the appeal process uh, and on appeal, the decision was upheld, although it was it was a slightly bizarre decision because it also suggested that Eastland Homes could apply for a warrant. But of course, at that stage, there'd been no possession proceedings yet. But there was a basic letter sent out and there were no reasons given as to why the appeal was upheld. So in the county court, uh, Miss White sought to defend the proceedings once they were issued by way of public law defence. And first, she said that they failed to actually follow their appeals policy. And secondly, she alleged um, procedural unfairness. Uh, specifically, there was a failure before the appeal um, took place to provide written copies of the evidence that Eastland Home had as to why 
they were bringing these proceedings. But there were other aspects of, of public law challenge as well. The failure to provide reasons in the decision, not taking into account uh, relevant considerations. But that possession claim was dismissed uh, and it demonstrates that failure to follow a policy in particular uh, can lead to a successful public law challenge in the county court. The other case is the Leicester City Council case uh, and Shearer. Now, that was a case where the occupier essentially became a trespasser upon the death of the tenant. And the allocations policy of Leicester City Council allowed the council to consider whether or not um, a tenancy should be given uh, to the occupier who'd become a trespasser. And uh, Leicester City Council refused to do that. And essentially, um, the public law defence was successful at the county court and the court of appeal upheld that decision and again it was a failure to follow the policy there was an allocations policy in place it allowed for a consideration of whether or not someone should be granting uh, granted a tenancy in these particular circumstances and the mere refusal to even consider exercising that power was enough to be a breach of public law now the local authority attempted on appeal to uh, defend the matter in, in terms of um, there not being a proper housing register application, no identification had been provided um, and so on and so forth. And it was held that the local authority couldn't rely on procedural failures to attempt to defend its own failure to consider its discretion under its allocations policy. So those are two examples of successful challenges in terms of policies. And there's some examples um, set out which are uh, which were not necessarily successful as well. So um, they can county court public law defenses to county court proceedings can can result in um, possession actions or any in fact any claim being dismissed if they are successful. But it is important, and I've set this out on the next slide, um, to consider what the court can do on a public law challenge in the county court. Um, as Jane said, of course, absolutely do everything in advance and try and reduce the risk of having these arguments um, levied against you by way of defence in the county court. But if you do find yourself in a situation where it's been alleged you've breached your policy and on the face of it there may well have been a breach then it is not necessarily the case that your claim is dismissed i've set out the case of barnsley and norton on this side and effectively what the court said is where you're relying upon a public law defence, then the court should look at what could happen in judicial review proceedings and in that case this was a breach in relation to a disability. Um, in that case, effectively, the judge said it wouldn't have made a difference to the local authority's decision to seek possession and therefore a possession order could still be made. Uh, and the next case in 2016, which I've set out on the next slide in uh, Holly and Hillingdon, that there was a similar approach there in, in terms of what the court could do. And so public bodies need to think about its evidence when it's faced with a public law defence in a county court and think about, well, if the policy has not been followed, if the policy had been followed, what would the result be? And if it can be demonstrated to the court that inevitably the same result would happen in any claim, then it doesn't necessarily result in the claim being dismissed. And on the final slide, so we have got some time for some questions, although I'm not uh, sure there are any, I've, I've put a few other examples of um, the court essentially um, setting out then in public law defences, you can look at what would happen in a judicial review and, and you have to think about what the consequences of the defence are and that's not necessarily dismissal of the claim. But I do want to highlight uh, the Geist and Lambeth case at the bottom there. So 
Section 31 2A, as I'm sure you'll all be aware of the Senior Courts Act, essentially provides that the High Court in a, in a judicial review claim must refuse to grant relief and may not make any reward of damages under subsection four of section 31, if it appears to the court that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred. And in the guy's case, the, the court of appeal declined to decide whether or not that would apply. Now that was in a homelessness case and we've seen in, in some of the possession in place cases that actually that does appear to be an approach that the court has taken but I but I highlight that there's still a potential question there as to what the court can do on a successful public law defence so as James says best to be prepared and try and ensure that the policy is not breached in the first place so um that concludes um my talk and I hand back over to to James thank you very much sir that was um and to Lindsay. Um, well, uh, <clears throat> we have, um, I indicated the act, so if there are any questions, um, please put them on the Q&A function, but um, we don't have any at the moment. So I shall wrap up by just reminding you of the uh, other events coming up this week. Uh, Public Law and the Supreme Court on Tuesday, Duty of Candour and its impact on Wednesday and on Friday, consultation of the public law challenge, which will develop one of the uh, matters that I uh, raised briefly um, earlier. Um, but um, actually, I see we do have one question. Um, <clears throat> we have a question, but it's not actually, um, yeah, I think, uh, Mahat, you need to type it in. Um, so I'll just give you a second or two to do that. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, we are um, got a couple of minutes left. Um, nothing coming in yet. Um, yes. So the question is. Um, I'm unsure whether it necessarily falls into public law defence, but if someone was to raise a defence of mental disorder against a breach of tenancy for a housing association, um, is, is, um, is the question is whether that, that could give rise to a public law defence. I think that may be for Sarah primarily. So um, I don't know whether um, you want to, if there's any comment, in general terms, Sarah, you would like to? Thanks, James. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've focused on policies today. So, and this is not a housing webinar either. So, um, there are many public law defences that can be raised in terms of housing cases. James obviously touched upon uh, PSED in relation to challenges. And of course, this is how this type of defence usually comes up that someone will be saying that they have got some sort of disability under the Equality Act um, and thereafter either you discriminated against them or you've not considered the PSED or even if you have a policy, <laughs> bringing it back to policies um, in terms of how you treat people with disabilities and the types of uh, and vulnerabilities, they can effectively raise that as part of the defence to a uh, possession claim. So. Um, Yes, is, is the short answer. Obviously, if your claim is based on reasonableness, then it might all fall within um, the considerations of the court for that anyway. But if you've got a mandatory claim for possession, so Section 21 or Ground 8 of the Housing Act 1988 or any of those types of things, then um, it, it may well be that they're, they're raising it as a defence to, um, oh, sorry, alarms going off in chambers, um, raise it to a defence to the claim to try and get the claim dismissed because they don't have reasonableness to fall back on. So in short, uh, the answer is like, yes. I don't know if anyone on the panel disagrees with me. <laughs> Thanks. Very happy to leave that to you. That's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> I think the uh, next question uh, moves 
uh, of the issue of policy as such. And, but I think you um, <coughs> dealt with that in your answer as well. So I, I'm going to call the um, close the formally close the this morning's webinar. Thank you all for attending, and to remind you that um, the slides will be sent to you following uh, this. Uh, us closing the seminar and a recording will be available on our website. So thank you very much indeed for attending. Uh, thank you to my two co-hosts. Um, farewell.